So our format today consists of two 20-minute presentations by each set of panelists. SSA Marine, the developer of the proposed cargo terminal, and we'll go first. Resources for a sustainable community will go second. Our moderator will ask a few questions of the panelists, and then our badge-wearing members will have the opportunity to ask questions. And Skip and I will share the mic with them. So we are absolutely delighted today to have a valued member of our program committee and former City Club board member serve as today's host and moderator. Bob Simmons had a distinguished 50-year career in journalism. Most recently, with broadcast journalism at the CBS station in Los Angeles. And when he retired, he was editorial commentator of King 5 News in Seattle. Uh, you will recognize him, if not, you'll recognize him, of course. So please join me in welcoming the very gracious Bob Simmons to the podium. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, the idea that I retired from CBS in LA is a nice concept. <laughs> I was one of 52 people that got fired in one week. Uh, you'd have to have been hiding out somewhere, refusing to read newspapers or online news media or listening to the radio, not to have been aware of the most important issue to be discussed in Bellingham since the early 1980s. That is, of course, uh, the cost of Kate Middleton's wedding dress. <laughs> it, it isn't uh, wedding trains, but freight trains and huge cargo ships that we're talking about today. In the first full-blown public forum concerning Gateway Pacific shipping port proposal, share point. Uh, Chuck mentioned the format, 20 minutes each side. Please don't go over 20 minutes. If you do go over 20 minutes, a uh, selective tsunami will roar across the parking lot, blow you out the back door. Uh, at the end of the two presentations, I get to ask a couple of questions, and then uh, we throw you to the Lions. Actually, we throw you to the City Club. The Lions is a different club. They meet. <laughs> Chuck touched on this, but I will also civil discourse and the reverence for opposing viewpoints is a hallmark of, of city club forums. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I ask, suppress uh, the urge to voice your disapproval of what somebody just said. You can do it later out in the parking lot. <laughs> Craig Cole and Bob Waters represent the affirmative position in this debate, and they go first. Gentlemen, if you'd like to take your seats up here at the head table. You're going to present from here, they do want me to get the heck out of the way. Okay. Okay, I'll sit down and I won't push the stopwatch and pull up the All right, here we go. Academy for this uh, great <laughs> opportunity. I've got to get this out of my system uh, so, uh, before somebody else does. So, so one of the people in favor of this project is named Cole, and one of them who's against it is named Delay. So, I'm sure some journalist is going to pick that up and make something of it. Uh, my colleague Megan Watt is over here, and we're going to try to signal each other uh, so that we get through this material really fast. And uh, Bob Waters, uh, vice, one of the senior executives of SSA Marine, is here as well. Uh, this is about uh, the, an opportunity to create a fourth anchor industry at uh, Cherry Point. I was, uh, and this will restore high wage jobs that we've lost. Uh, it will help uh, expand our. Uh, export capacity, that this will be done to high environmental standards and will be a great thing for future generations of people in Washington County. I was a county council member in the 80s when there was a dust up between the state and the county about what should or should not occur in terms of further industrial development at Cherry Point. And there was a compact reached at that time which has endured for several decades and still is reflected in the land use and shoreline planning for the area. 
And that really involves these principles that uh, the Cherry Point area is recognized as the major heavy industry area uh, for our region. It's the high wage job base that uh, there should be no dredging of the shoreline. The area should be set aside for water dependent industrial uses. And the preferred form of development would be pier on pylon development instead of dredging. And further, there would be only one more pier. So that's the compact that is held. I want to get right to the punchline. Um, this is a, an extraordinarily large uh, private infrastructure project. Uh, this is a five to seven hundred billion dollar privately funded construction project, which will produce uh, in the neighborhood of fifteen to seventeen hundred construction jobs over a two year period. That's per year. Uh, with the multiplier effect, it will uh, lift the job base by a total of about four thousand and it will uh, pump a great deal of new revenue into our uh, municipalities and other uh, taxing districts that are really suffering right now, uh, over $54 million a year in additional tax revenue. Ongoing employment, these are all union jobs during construction and after construction. Ongoing employment, uh, direct employment is in the neighborhood of 250 to 300. Uh, indirect employment, uh, the, the uh, economic activity that's created by service providers and others that service the facility will be almost another thousand. Altogether, we're looking at a, an, a permanent uplift in the job base of about uh, 1,500 jobs. And uh, these numbers are being refined because as, as engineering and design progresses and more information is being gathered and more economists are looking at these numbers and trying to predict the uh, impact, predicting future impact. These numbers will change a little bit, but they basically stay in the same zone. Um, and these are, by the way, these are high wage jobs. Top of the list, uh, high wage jobs, um, uh, like we can't find anymore. I don't think I need to tell anybody uh, that we need this. If you're employed, if you're uh, on a pension, or you're independently wealthy, uh, you're one of the fortunate ones, but you're uh, you're not like a lot of our fellow citizens here in Washington County who are really hurting. It's a very dire economic time. And when 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 Bob Ferris moved here a year ago or so, uh, and we talked, I realized that um, and he, he has Bob. I think you have some concerns about an industry at Cherry Point existing in the future, but. I keep forgetting that not everybody understands that we have established a heavy industrial area for a reason, which is to create the high wage jobs that really fuel the economy, and we need them now more than ever. Um, we are at the lowest level of industrial employment in 20 years. We've lost about 1,700 high wage jobs. Uh, it, the uh, industrial employment used to be about 24% of our job base, now it's about 17%. And um, our uh, uh, construction workers are, they've been decimated, 42% unemployment. It's just a, a heartbreak, and uh, there are a lot of people hurting. And Western is about ready to see, um, over a three-year period, half of the state funding uh, lost, and Western is a very important employer in this community. So the impact has been that our uh, standard of living is declining. Uh, our per capita, our, our personal income is about 20% of the state average and our average hourly wage is about four dollars an hour less than the state average. That would be okay if our cost of living uh, was proportionately lower, but it's not. We still have effectively Seattle cost of living without the wages, and uh, so this puts people in a real squeeze play. Uh, how do we get out of this? Almost anybody that you can talk to, and the governor asked me in 2009 to help, to volunteer to help canvas CEOs and economists and others to, to ask how we can recover uh, in this state. Exports are at the top of the list. We're a debtor nation. We owe the Chinese three trillion dollars. And uh, we can't continue like this. We have to bring cash into the country. Um, and the Obama administration has a, uh, an objective to double exports over five years and uh, the Gregoire administration has a similarly aggressive uh, uh, export initiative. When Gary Locke, our governor, was uh, U.S. Uh, Commerce Secretary, we went back and met with him. He's la laser focused on expanding imports and, and I was, like I'm sure a lot of you here, very proud to see him uh, named ambassador to China and his first words were, I want to open up markets for U.S. exports. So we've got to export. 
And the, the nonpartisan uh, state chief economist and revenue forecaster, Arun Rana, has probably put it most simply, which is that we just can't go on being a, a buyer of things in the world. We've also got to be a seller to make our economy work. The reason that this project is so important is that it helps U.S. commodity producers from Chicago to the northern tier states out here. It helps those, those commodity producers become more cost efficient in getting their products to Asian markets where there's high demand and good prices. The commodities that we're talking about are various. They include coal, grain, potash, wood biofuels, and I'm forgetting some, but um, Bob will correct me, I'm sure, uh, when he gets up here. So these are dry bulk commodities, and the 75% uh, of, of delivering those, the cost of delivering those commodities in Asia is the cost of transportation. So the most efficient way, and we, and by the way, when we produce these commodities, we produce them at very high labor and environmental standards, which gives our producers a cost disadvantage to begin with. And we compete with other countries like Indonesia and Australia and other places to supply these markets. So our, our producers start with a, with a disadvantage, but they make it up with productivity, and they need an efficient uh, transportation infrastructure to get those cargos to market. Rail is a very carbon and cost efficient mechanism to transport uh, commodities over land. And the most efficient way to transport those commodities over water is in what are called Cape Size vessels. These are the vessels you see coming through our waterways up into Vancouver ports. They're about uh, the size of uh, the, the uh, ships that come into Cherry Point now, but they're a little wider and deeper. And uh, they're very uh, cost efficient because they create economies of scale. Of that transportation cost in getting cargoes to market, about half of it is the vessel cost. And using these vessels, U.S. producers can cut their vessel costs by about 30%. I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers out, but it's really what makes the economics work for our U.S. producers. The problem is rail and cave sized vessels serve, trying to service uh, bulk uh, commodities can't talk to each other on the west coast of the United States. There's no place that can service these ships without dredging, which is uh, not something you want to engage in for environmental and cost reasons. Except there's one place that can do this, and that's Cherry Point. It's a site that has naturally deep water and which can accommodate these vessels without dredging. So when we look at, um, uh, when we look at Cherry Point as a regional asset, uh, and then you go across the country, it's viewed more as a national asset because you have a lot of people who are looking at how can we get our cargoes to China and, be, uh, and Asia or in other parts of Asia and be competitive in the global market. Um, the, those cargoes either don't get shipped now, there's a lack of capacity, uh, they get piled up um, and you have vessels waiting to be uh, unloaded, which is very costly. You charter those vessels, you still have to pay for them even if they're doing nothing. And uh, the other thing is those cargoes go through our go through BC ports, uh, which are booming. So Megan, if you could move on. Those cargoes come through our um, uh, corridor now and uh, are uh, shipped out of BC ports and are increasingly uh, uh, going to do so. So Bob, can you come up and talk a little bit about that? First of all, thank you very much for uh, having us here today. Um, but I, Craig's done a nice job of giving you kind of the economic overview of the project. What I'd like to do is take this opportunity to give you a little background on who SSA Marine is, the company, and then talk about the project itself in a little bit more specifics. You can see SSA Marine. Um, we are a, a building, we started in Billingham in 1949. We were started by a gentleman named Fred Smith, who in the uh, 50s moved the company down to Seattle. Fred was succeeded by his, um, his son, Ricky Smith, who's our chairman. And then subsequently to that, the third generation of the family that still owns and majority owner and operator of the company is a gentleman named John Hemingway, who was Fred's uh, grandson. All three of those gentlemen were born here in Bellingham. We are a local company. Uh, one of the things that, that's interesting to note, as Craig mentioned, is we are a union shop. Everything we do is union. We're the largest employer of ILWU longshoremen on the West Coast. Um, our company is now in 125 uh, ports around the world. We've grown, it's kind of a nice success story over the 60 years. We've grown to the point that we're the fifth large, we're the largest US terminal port operator and the fifth largest in the world. We compete with other governments primarily. Government of Singapore, government of Dubai. 
but we're still a, a local company here from Seattle. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand is that we do have a lot of experience in developing greenfield terminal projects. We're doing this all over the world right now. We've got projects in Chile, in Panama, in Mexico, and we're building right now two new terminals, container terminals in Vietnam. So we do have experience in doing these types of projects. It's important when you understand this particular project that this is exactly the type of project that Whatcom County was envisioning when they designated Cherry Point as a heavy industrial area. They were looking for four anchor tenants out there and one being waterborne transportation related company. And that's what exactly what this project is. This project takes advantage of the four key attributes that we have out there. We've got natural deep water. We've got large enough area to accommodate the cargoes. We have 1,100 acres acquired out there. We're only using two thirds of that area for cargo storage, both open and covered storage. So we have enough area to buffer the surrounding area um, and insulate those storage locations from outside um, influences. Uh, the other is that we already have rail servicing to, to the market. So no new rail tracks have to be brought in to, um, to build, to access the facility. Um, the rail is already accommodated right now to uh, Alcoa and to uh, BP up there. And uh, the fourth is obviously that it is zoned as heavy industrial. The other thing that's really important here to understand is that the area is designated as an aquatic reserve, and we're very, we like that concept. There's a management place, management plan that the aquatic reserve was put in place this year, and we think that's a great thing. It holds a very high bar to protect the environment out there, and we think that's great. We don't believe that it's either or. We don't think it's either the environment or industry that can succeed. We think that we have to work together. We think that we can complement that industry has to be a steward of the environment as well. To benefit and work on a long-term basis and serve the community, industry has to work and be a steward of the environment. The other thing that's very important to understand about this project, some people will, make, will try to make you understand that this is only a coal facility. Trust me when I say this, that's not the case. This is a multi-commodity facility. We as investors, if this is a $600 million project, we're gonna to have to put in approximately $200 million in equity. You don't do that based on one part. Commodity prices is very cyclical. Two years ago, coal wasn't economic, economical to ship. We have to, just like your 401k, we have to have a diversified portfolio of products that we can ship and be very versatile such that when one cargo is economical, we can ship it. When it's not economical, we have two or three other cargos that we can ship. We can't count on any one particular cargo. So being a multi-commodity terminal is extremely important to us as investors and operators. As you can see here, Craig talked about the products we're looking at. We're looking at grain, we're looking at coal, potash, calcine coke right there from the refinery. Um, one of the products is, is corn. We're talking to the agricultural folks right now you can see the forecast here to what they're looking at from uh, uh, coal export growth, and there's a shortfall of capacity right now. They're doubling in volume from 2010 to 2011, and beyond that, they're looking at expanded growth. We actually have Dan Newhouse on May 19th coming up here. Dan Newhouse is the Washington State Director of Agriculture, and Dan's helping us market this from a grain standpoint and working with us to get many of the Washington State uh, wheat growers and other grain growers, as well as um, grain growers from, as Craig pointed out, the middle of the United States, from that whole northern tier area. So there's a great number of uh, grain volumes that are out there for us. Okay. Uh, as we said, this is a union shop. We are a union organization. These are high wage, family wage jobs with very high benefits. If you look at the ILWU, these are the top shelf benefits that these people have. Any, any kind of union can have any place. These, these folks have very good wages and very good, very good uh, benefits. I want to talk about environment a little bit and how this project works. Um, you can see the picture up on top is the West Shore Terminal up in, in Vancouver, BC, and below is our terminal down below. The West Shore Terminal was built in 1970. Now you can see on the right hand side the number of regulations and new acts that have come in place since that time. Um, we would not build a terminal like West Shore today. 
the way that that is exposed out there on a landfill pod and exposed to wind, they can't control what's happening from a dust standpoint and, and movement of that dust into the water. Our project, on the other hand, is on 1,100 acres of land. We're a half a mile away, nearly a half a mile away from the water size or storage areas. Totally different. It's like comparing, when you look at the environmental programs and acts that are in place and what, your, what the requirements are and what we're gonna do with our facility, it's like comparing a 1970 gas guzzling GTO to a 2011 Prius. It's night and day. And right now, cargo, coal cargo is still going through Bellingham and Whatcom County up to the West Shore facility. And they're expanding that facility. If we don't handle the cargo here, that cargo is going to continue to go through Bellingham and Whatcom County and continue to go to West Shore and be treated and handled in that, that respect. The other thing that I really want to point out that I think is very important is that this process that we're going through now, we're just in the first steps of what we're doing now in the process of identifying what's going on and the impacts of this project. We're working through a, an extensive two-year program with both the federal government and the state government. Uh, in the state government, the Fed is, is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The, on the state agency sides, we're working with Ecology, uh, WDFW, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Natural Resources, and putting together a scope for an EIS process and then also conduct the EIS process. The scope will be determined by the Corps of Engineers, and the, eight, the groups that, that conduct the EIS will also be selected by the Corps of Engineers. So that scope will be done, the study will be done, all the impacts will be identified for the project. At that point, once the impacts are done, we sit down and work out with the Corps and with the state and federal agencies how we can mitigate those. And we have to come to an agreement on how we can mitigate all those impacts. So there's a very extensive program, and there's public comment in that entire process. Um, the other thing we're doing is working with the tribes. Uh, obviously, they have some usual and custom fishing rights, and we're sitting down and talking to those folks, too, and looking what the impacts are for them and working with those guys to mitigate those situations. All of this happens, obviously, before we get to any permits and can move ahead with the project. As I said, what's the alternative? If we don't build this facility, this cargo is going to move anyway. Right now, it's economically, it makes sense. So this cargo is going to go through, and it's going through now, like I said, 5 million tons a day for a year. <laughs> it's going through Bellingham and Whatcom County right now up to West Shore. They're expanding their facility right now to do, on a short term, another 6 million tons, and they're looking for plans to do it on a greater terms uh, for more capacity on the building. So what happens is, if this doesn't happen now, all the impacts are still felt here in Whatcom County and Bellingham that don't benefit from any of the jobs. What we ask, and I think some of, some of the local folks here talk about, is they want to have informed dialogue. They want to know what's going on with the project and understand it, and that's what we want to do is communicate to you folks. What we think is really important here, because there are a number of jobs, some people will tell you that it's only a coal terminal, we should kill this project right now. With the economic benefits that creates explain to you folks, and the ex extensive program that we have for two years, to me it only makes sense. Let's go through the program, identify what the impacts are, make sure that we can mitigate these. Then let's see what we can do, because there's a huge impact that it means in terms of jobs and tax revenues here for Whatcom County and Bellingham. Last one. I also want to just give you an example of some of the people and some of the organizations here that are uh, supporting the project. This is a partial list, but we're going to give you some examples. Again, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. And at the end, we'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much, John. And thank you for getting out on time. OK. Uh, the loyal opposition, Bob Ferris and Matt Crow, will be working together, representing uh, resources for sustainable communities, uh, organization, business, environmental organization that's well known here in Bellingham, been here for years. I guess, are you up for? Okay, here we go, Bob Ferris. Uh, good afternoon, I'm uh, going to change the tone of this presentation a little bit because it's my job to critique what was just uh, put out there, so by definition it's, it's a different tone. Today I want to talk um, about Cherry Point, the scope of this project and the local impacts. 
I'm a scientist working for a science-based organization, so I look through that lens when I look at projects like this. But I'm also living within 200 yards of, of the tracks. These impacts are not abstract to me. They're very real. My wife and I hear them every night. SSA Marine is currently in the permitting process. In its purest form, the permitting process is them asking us for permission to cause us damage. We want to talk about that damage so you are better informed about this project. <coughs> under normal circumstances, under normal circumstances, this level of damage to long-term economic growth, community health, property values, and the environment would far outweigh the benefit of 213 jobs by 2026. <coughs> but in this circumstance, powerful forces are acting to tip the scale. So who are these forces? These forces are Goldman Sachs, SSA, Peabody Coal, with a little help from Burlington Northern. We're talking about massive influence backed by billions of dollars and a lot of clout. And they are exerting political pressure, running a fancy, massive PR campaign, and exercising economic pressure wherever and whenever they can. And they are asking us to trust them. But they don't have a great track record regarding promises. In fact, the Powder River Basin, uh, only 4% of the promise mitigation has occurred uh, in that area. Coal energy uh, industry has about a 54% delivery rate on promise jobs. And please don't get me started with Goldman Sachs. And our experience with Cherry Point and SSA is that they too have problems with promises even when part of a settlement agreement. Their story always seems to keep changing. Before we dive into this, let's remember that this community was barely able to swallow the proposal that was put forth in 1992 for a much smaller project. And this current proposal makes the 1992 project look unambition, unambitious in comparison. So what happened since that time? Goldman Sachs bought 49% of SSA Marine parent company Carex. Peabody Coal's Eastern uh, Coal Market shrank, the economy tanked, and jobs at any cost became the order of the day. I find it painfully ironic uh, in this equation that Goldman Sachs in any form could profit from the troubled economy they created. <laughs> Since 1992, this project has grown six-fold in size. If the project was marginal in 1992, how does making it six times larger make that better? The targeted commodities have changed dramatically also, from the benign to the dangerous. Yet in September 2010, SSA was still selling potash and wheat to us in their lobbying visit, despite the fact that Peabody Coal was talking about this project in their public presentations in June of 2010. Destroying and altering um, 5.8 acres of wetlands is a serious impact, one to be undertaken only after intense consideration and study. When you multiply that by 27 times, it takes it beyond all reason. I suppose it is fun to play the numbers game with train traffic and say that these future traffic levels are within recent experience. But let's look at reality and annual tonnage. A 10-year-old uh, council of government study pegged 2001 cargo levels through Bellingham at about 6 million metric tons. And predicted in 2012, uh, we would see 10 million or so tons annually. All things being equal, and the Cherry Point Terminal runs as SSA claims, we would see 34 million metric tons in 2015 and 64 million metric tons in 2026, or 10 times the tonnage of 2001. Clearly, we are looking at a huge terminal and a massive increase in rail traffic, but let's talk details. SSA representatives have argued that coal dust from trains is only an issue within 100 miles of the mines. Here is a picture of a train in Maryland, more than 100 miles from the mines. On the eastern seaboard, trains are required to be sprayed, are sprayed 
before they leave the coal mine. Uh, so let's talk about these trains. Each of these roughly 17,000 ton trains can have up to 125 cars and four locomotives. That means mile and a half long trains. With 10 trips full and 10 trips empty, heading back to the mines, that's 20 trips or 30 miles of additional trains a day passing um, past our businesses, homes, parks, and waterfront. All this adds up to 48 million metric tons of coal, or 88% of what is being shipped out of there. And we're not even counting the other commodities in these numbers. This is Roberts Bank or West Shore. Roberts Bank stores coal on 80 acres and ships up to 29 million tons a year. This is the same proposed coal footprint for Cherry Point. They plan to ship 48 million tons. The dust from Roberts Bank currently travels five miles. SSA Marine claims that they are going to ship almost double that amount of coal from the same footprint and cause less dust. That is simply impossible. In this, it is important to note that every coal terminal in North America has a dust issue. Mm -hmm. And Cherry Point is going to be the largest coal terminal in North America. The ship atop is the Cape Violet that visited West Shore last week. She's 180,000 tons. The largest ferry that services the island is 2,500 tons and holds 1,000 passengers. Yes, these photos are to scale. The straits are already overcrowded with oil tanker and other large vessel traffic, and these boat carriers have a poor safety record. We are very concerned about the potential for collisions and oil spills. <coughs> now, we, we could talk about regional, national, and global impacts for hours, but today, in this venue, talking with our neighbors, we want to focus on local impacts. If I owned a waterfront business, this project would scare me. Folks tend not to frequent the businesses that are hard to get to, but it really doesn't take much to change human behavior. Even the perception of delays keep people away. If this project goes through the prospects, prospects for a successful waterfront development diminish. Waterfront redevelopment is a $2 billion uh, proposition four times the size of the investment proposed for Terry Point. It represents more jobs over a longer period of time with substantially less environmental and social damage. This is a picture of a train near Powder River Basin coal mine with coal dust spewing all over. We will not see this from trains in downtown Bellingham. But look closely at the visible exhaust from the diesel engine. A little bit hard to see in that slide, but most of you were close to be able to see it up there. Um, we will get all of that diesel. And studies indicate that people living within 200 yards of the railroad complex in Stockton, California, have cancer rates double those of other their next nearest neighbors that are far away. SSA is debating the relevance of this study fine. But I cannot imagine a scenario where we run 30,000 more locomotives a year through Bellingham and freighters burn several hundred thousand gallons of diesel while in port, where we would not see an increase in cancer rates as well as respiratory problems. We all know that burning coal injects mercury into the atmosphere. Fewer know that the biggest source for new mercury in Whatcom County is China. With a strong relationship between mercury and birth effects, why do we want to chance putting future generations at risk? Coal robs the water of precious oxygen. These pictures show a loading system intended to minimize dust. Yet look at the dust on the deck of the ship after only 5% has been loaded. These photos were taken last week at Roberts Bank where there are extensive low oxygen dead zones surrounding the facility. Orcas, salmon and, salmon, and herring are iconic species for many of us. But they also define a food chain that begins at Cherry Point and supports many local jobs. 
The loss of dissolved oxygen and dust-covered seagrasses could break that chain with impacts to many associated industries. Coal covers communities much like these marine grasses photographed near the Seward, uh, Alaska coal terminal. It touches everything from property values and self-image to habitat quality and happiness. It is bar none the worst fossil fuel on the planet. Coal was part of our past, but should not be part of our future. This is a long-range shot of the community we hold here. This view is also inviting, and that is exactly our closing message. We invite everyone who, who values this Bellingham and Whatcom County to join us to look for something better than this short-sighted an unsustainable project. There are many better approaches to provide more jobs for more people while at the same time preserving our regional reputation, natural splendor, and future generations. Come join that discussion. Thank you very much for both of our kids here. Splendid job of explaining the issues. We're going to get our ranks here. I get to ask a couple of questions, one of each side, and then it's up to the members. Well said. My first question is for the folks from SSA. It is common for indirect effects of projects like this to be included in environmental impact studies. SSA has said it will oppose in the scoping project, the scoping process rather, oppose a study of the impact of increased coal train traffic as part of the EIS for the Gateway Pacific project. How can you consider an EIS to be complete without a study of the impact of the coal train traffic of at least 18 trips per day of trains a mile and a half long through the towns along the I-5 corridor. Either one of you. Is this on? Okay. Uh, fair question. Um, what we look at is we know that this is a very extensive process we're going through with the uh, environmental groups with, with uh, Corps of Engineers and with uh, the state agencies, Whatcom County being the late lead agency in the state, they are the ones that finalize what the scope is. Done. They are the ones that determine what the final scope is for the impacts that we're supposed to measure from an environmental impact study standpoint. We agree with whatever the Corps and the uh, state agencies tell us that we have to study, that's what we study. We'll look at all the impacts that they tell us to look at. Let's let you do it a little later on. All right. Question for the folks from Resources for Sustainable Communities. Unemployment in Whatcom County now stands at 9.6. Seems to be the second highest on record. This project promises 1,400 new construction jobs and, according to SSA, some 400 permanent unionized living wage jobs. Two part question. Is there room in your position that allows for the port to be built and operated under any circumstances? And if not, what suggestions have you for providing these hundreds of living wage jobs in Whiteland County? 
Well, let's first start with talking about how many jobs we're actually talking about. Um, when you look at SSA Marine's um, permit application, which your company signed, um, it says that there are going to be 89 jobs in 2015 and 213 jobs by 2026. You, um, in the press, repeatedly talk about 400 or 430 or something like that. But when we're talking about jobs that are actually on site, um, those numbers per, per year permit application um, are um, what I just stated. Um, yes, we think that we need to make more jobs in the county, and, and there is no way that, that we as an organization, as a sustainability organization, looking at, at economic, environmental, and social issues. Uh, would oppose the creation of, of jobs as long as there weren't um, uh, circumstances that, that made that um, less than beneficial to, for the rest of us. And I would encourage people um, to come together and talk about those sorts of things. In fact, we're going to undertake a, an effort over the next six or seven months we're trying to get grant uh, funding for it at this point to start talking about other, other options. My other concern is that this project, um, when you look at what it will provide as far as jobs versus what the waterfront redevelopment will provide as far as jobs, this is a heck of a lot smaller um, and uh, the jobs will not last as long. And when you talk about the, what, 1,300, 1,700, 3,000, depending upon um, what, what press release you look at, those jobs are gonna be here for two years. Um, and, and that's that's really not a sustainable sort of thing. Okay, here's what you've all been waiting for. Uh, there are two uh, young, handsome gentlemen circulating the room with microphones, and we would like very much, if we can, <laughs> to arrange to, to uh, alternate questions. Uh, one for the proponents, one for the opposition. And uh, so if you would let uh, the person with the microphone know who your question is directed at, then we'll try our best to make it as fair as we can and uh, alternate back and forth sides. Uh, Skip there then. Right here. Oh, okay, Chuck. Okay, My Michael. May, may, no, may, may I ask please? Make your questions as short as possible and, and begin with your question if you possibly can. Don't begin with a speech and then kind of try to find a question, mark it, so your voice goes up a little bit, so it sounds like a question. We, we, we would like to move along as fast as can. Why don't you go ahead, ma'am? Uh, mine is a general question. Uh, at the end of this two years of uh, uh, researching everything, who makes the final decision? Do we get a vote, or does the governor decide who makes the final decision on whether it's a go or not? Excellent question. Maybe both sides would like to take a try at that. Sure, sure. Um, the answer to that is the people that have to issue the, the permits are both uh, Whatcom County and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So both from the state side and from the federal side. Uh, beyond that as well, the DNR also is the one in charge of issuing or denying lease. It's, it's a whole litany of agencies at right. all levels of government. Did that answer your question? You don't get a vote. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the other part was no, you don't. Um, can I have one just a little bit too? Um, you don't get a vote as uh, Mark just mentioned, but what you do get, and, and Bob is absolutely right, they are required to follow whatever is told uh, or presented to them in the EIS for the scoping process. But the public does have a part to play in the scoping process. There will be required public meetings and the opportunity to provide written and oral testimony <coughs> vote about what you think needs to be covered in the EIS. Sure, you sure your, mi your mic is on. Were you, Matt, could, you, could everybody hear Matt? Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, your mic is on. All right, who's next? Where are you skipping? Uh, my name is Michael. This is a question for both sides, actually. Um, what one or two things would have to be different, or what would you have to realize you think is true now is not true for you to change your mind? What would you have to learn to decide, no, it's not a good project, or would you have to realize to say, okay, I'm willing to accept this project? Okay. Who wants to, who wants to take that first? I, mean, I, I have two quick ones that are easy. Not be goal and the project be small. 
Got that? Great. Um, don't forget there's really nothing wrong with coal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a spelling issue. <laughs> I think I would, uh, if I did not believe that this uh, was uh, significantly net beneficial to the community, I wouldn't be involved in this. But this is exactly the kind of industrial development at Cherry Point that we have been seeking for 30 or 40 years. The jobs numbers that uh, Bob has cited are not correct, and you don't need to believe me because we have a set of regional economists that are betting the numbers and will be uh, re-examining them and reporting to them. So. Uh, but the jobs numbers uh, are not a little bit. I kind of feel like I'm on the program with Glenn Beck sometimes. And, uh, uh, we have one Glenn Beck at Seattle High School. I'm a Seattle High grad, so I have to bring that up. But I, I would just ask people to focus on that process because that is where the facts will be submitted, where they will be vetted by third, independent third parties, and then you can take your information from there. I don't ask you to believe anything except uh, what occurs through a regulated process. Next. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, who's next? John. Oh, okay, here. Here. Over here. Uh, where are you? Skip? Here. Skip's right here. Okay, here we are. <laughs> transportation path that goes further east of here and north of here and back to Cherry Point. I'd like to know more about that and the feasibility of using that. There's a question. Who'd like to tackle? Well, the, the railroad is, uh, has indicated that it's really too early to talk about routing. Um, that it, they don't know the level of the cargoes, the types of cargoes, and there's this is something that will be part of an engagement process over a period of time. But they can't answer that question now because they don't know exactly what capacity we're talking about and what the nature of the cargoes are. What if I get a quick clarification? That means that it's not necessary that the trains will come through Bellingham. I, I don't I simply don't know. We can't speak for the railroad. Yeah. We, 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 we don't know. You know, we can't speak for those folks. What, I, what, what is important to understand is that, and, and one of the things where there was kind of a, a misconception with Bob's numbers is, and what was actually in the EID is, we're not going to be full day one. I mean, I would love it from a, from a business standpoint if we were full day one. People that understand infrastructure projects also understand that there's a, usually a very slow build and a ramp up time to get volumes up and going. I mean, it's not just a matter of building, that people also have to be selling the cargoes to other people overseas and those kinds of things, right? So what happens is we don't know exactly what the volume levels are going to be yet. We, what we're permitting for and what we're doing the EIS for is the maximum. We're looking at what the maximum impacts would be. That doesn't mean we're gonna have those maximum impacts day one, right? But we're, that's what we're going out and testing for. But the question was asked on both sides, would you guys want to? Um, actually, I do have a question for you about that. One of the, uh, one of the notable things that happened when we did announce the 24 million time grant. The microphone. Speak into the mic, please. Silk the mic. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the things that you did announce was an agreement with Peabody Coal for 24 million tons of coal. Um, how quickly do you expect to implement that once the project has been running? Well, if you, if you read their press release, actually what it said was a contract up to 24 million tons. So what they've done is, is we worked with those folks on capacity that they would have the rights to capacity up to 24 million tons. We don't know. They don't know what, what the volumes are yet, what the build is yet. We don't know when the facility will actually be done and what the market are going to be at that point in time. So it's really more a, a right of first refusal for capacity, you know, for the open storage area, but there's no contract. Can we ask a question, Bob? Pardon. Bob, Pardon. can I ask a quick, quick question? No. Yeah, we can, we can do that, but I should be okay. pretty short and brief. All right, okay. There's been a lot of discussion about coal dust, and I want to make an offer to Matt and to Bob. If we can, because I've examined this issue in great detail, if we can go together and establish that there's never been a complaint of coal dust to the Northwest Clean Air Agency, will you agree to stop sort of the fear-mongering on this issue? 
Uh, okay. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then, and then and then go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting thing, and this is the argument that they're using up in, in Seward, is that because it's not regulated by the Air Agency, um, it can't be regulated by um, the Clean Water Act. Uh, well, the, the coal dust is not traveling that far, so it doesn't become a clean air issue. But it is a clean water issue, and it is a human health issue. Um, so um, it may not, not be covered under a, a clean air permit, but, but it is something that needs to be dealt with under any way to Gentlemen, I'd, I'd love to I'd love to stay here and, and, and have you bat the badminton back and forth all afternoon. But there are a lot of people out here who pay to get in and eat and, uh, yeah. and and take part in this. So we'd like to get the question from the members. Go ahead, Marion. Yeah, Marion Bedell. Uh, also on the transportation question. Uh, imagine driving all our truck traffic on a one lane highway. That's what we're going to have on this rail issue as the way I understand it. So the question is, what are the alternative rail routes, you tried to dismiss it a minute ago, which are possibly to be used, and how is the going and coming traffic going to be managed on a one-lane rail? Okay, we're going to ask you to specify who, the, who you were aiming to asking the question. Yes, yes, yes. All right, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, let me just answer this. We can't speak for the railroad. I don't have the answer for you on that. I, we don't have the answer on that. But let me say this, that the railroad is aware of the issues and the concerns, and they are going to be, in, what they told us is they are going to be engaged in this process. Okay, hand up over here. Skip. And uh, anywhere else? Here you go. Just, just, just a minute, wait for the mic, please. Hi, go ahead. my name is Vince. A question for which side, please? Uh, for SSA, you mentioned that you have plenty of storage area for the coal. Did you say a half a mile or a quarter mile inland? But how are you going to manage the coal dust? You say you're not going to do it the way uh, the Tawasin area does it. Yeah, and it, it's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Actually, I didn't have enough time in my presentation to uh, get to that. There's a number of ways that we're looking at it. Again, what we're doing is we're doing some modeling study right now as to what the historical winds are out in the area and what the impacts would be to the coal piles. The coal piles generally are about 64 feet high. We're looking at a number of different options. We're looking at obviously doing some spraying of water to hold the dust down, which is a customary practice. The other thing we're looking at is the opportunity to put up poplar trees around the outside. We're even looking at having 90 foot wind blocks on the water side or some other areas as needed. So we're going through and looking at this much differently than West Shore. As, as I said in my presentation, this is a much different animal than the West Shore project and the way we're looking at this thing. We're doing a lot of modeling. We're looking at these wind blocks would be 90 feet when you get 64 feet of, of uh, piles out there. I mean, if need be, we'll put them around the whole, the whole uh, coal pile area the outside storage area. We're looking at all these kinds of things. That's why this process is so important to look and see exactly what the impacts are and work with the agencies to find the right mitigations to protect everything. Another question over here. Yeah, Richard May here. Um, so if, if the Delta port there is dealing with the 1970s version of the regulations before we knew how to regulate these things correctly, and, and we're looking at this Cherry Point one uh, being uh, up to date, well, uh, there's been an assertion that if Cherry Point does go through with the shipping terminal, that all that same traffic's going to start building and building, but just going up to Canada, where someone's going to make $40 an hour unloading instead of us, and we're going to be dealing with all the same amount of traffic and, and, and whatever effects there are. Could I ask either side to refute or agree, with, and to what extent on that? I'd like to ask uh, Bob Ferris and Jim McElroy. Yeah, I'm, this this is a rumor that's been out there for uh, a good bit of time, and, and we've had to deal with it. Um, Canada at this point is a little bit capacity um, challenge. Um, there is some expansion. Um, both Bob and Craig talked about that, um, and they're they're talking about expanding at um, uh, Roberts Bank as well as at uh, Prince Rupert. Um, I'm not sure based upon people we've talked to, whether traffic going to Prince Rupert would come through here. Um, we, we suspect that traffic going to Roberts Bank would come through here, but their capacity without building another island is, is probably in the, uh, you guys are char characterizing it as about, about 4 million um, uh, tons more. 
uh, without building another island. So there's a big difference between 4 million tons and 48 million metric tons. Um, so no, the train traffic wouldn't be the same and wouldn't go through here anyway. That's not Quickly, I mean, when yeah, you Okay, that's not 100% accurate. Right now there's 5 million tons that already go to of Powder River Basin coal that go through. Our idea is when you're looking at total train count too, you have to net out the trains that are already going up to West Shore today, the coal trains. We're hoping to make those take a left-hand turn here at Cherry Point, go out in Cherry Point. The other thing is they're, what the expansion they're doing now is putting a new rotary dumper in up there at the terminal. And they're gonna take the capacity from 27 million tons a year to 33 million tons. That's another six million tons on top of the five million that's already, already going through. In addition to that, they have plans to expand that facility in the storage area off of the facility and convey it onto the terminal. It's not a matter of what their storage capacity is, it's a matter of their birth capacity. If they have more birth capacity if they can build more storage area. Can we move on? <laughs> There's been a lot of talk with the railroad uh, traffic from the railroad. What about our roads, the infrastructure on our roads? Who's responsible for paying you know, for the Grandview, there's going to be a lot of traffic going through there, big trucks. I mean, it's not all railroad stuff. Who, who's going to pay for all those road improvements and, and whatnot from that? Yeah. What's your tackle that? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, it's um, the, um, you know, the dilemma really for us a bit as a community is that if we want industry, um, you need to have rail, and if you don't use rail, you use semis. So. If this were a container cargo facility, for example, you'd have a different conversation about uh, filling up uh, I-5 with semis. So uh, it is a bit of a dilemma for any community that, that um, uh, wants to have high wage jobs, industrial based jobs, but also needs a transportation network. Um, the process will scope those issues. That's precisely what the uh, EIS process is aimed at and is looking at trying to anticipate what those impacts are and then to uh, establish required <coughs> mitigation. And again, it's not the company that makes that decision, it's the, it's the whole litany of regulatory agencies. Yeah, I mean the well, public pays. Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's often the project costs are, are uh, I mean, I've been involved in several uh, much smaller commercial developments and I can assure you that uh, Public agencies have a way of making developers pay for their impacts. No, that hasn't been my That's, experience. When I served on the Cherry Point work group, um, for, for information for people here to fill in on the path, I recommend the um, Hawk and Watch issue of uh, August, September 1999, which detailed the results of the settlement agreement. I would like to ask SSA why none of these uh, points in the agreement have been carried out thus far. Yeah, I'd love to answer that. I'd love to answer that. Um, to say none of them have been carried out is, is not accurate. <laughs> but but let, me, let, let me, I don't have the exact list, but I know that we have carried out some. But let me, let me explain this to you. In the settlement agreement, there's a number of studies that need to be done, and they're time-sensitive studies prior to construction, okay? So that we can find out what, this, what needs to be done from a mitigation standpoint and establishing benchmarks for some, for some adaptive management programs that come in place after operations. The issue here was in the same time, in 99, uh, then uh, Lands Commissioner Jennifer Belcher designated the area at Cherry Point an aquatic reserve. That was designated as an aquatic reserve, but there was never a management plan put in place. So now, let me ask a question. How many are bankers in here? Are there any bankers? Okay, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> They're all about making loans. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. <laughs> here, here, here's the fact. When, when the government put a legislation move out there in terms of making that aquatic reserve without a management plan, there's no parameters no rules for which we had to play in or understand how to play in in being a company out there, right? So it wasn't designated what we could and couldn't do. So for us to go to a bank at that point in time and get a loan, and they're gonna sit there and say, yeah, but you don't know if you can do that. But you don't know if you can do that on a 500, 600 million dollar project. They wouldn't loan us the money. Now, what's happened, the reason we're doing this now, different than what Bob said, 
The reason we're doing this now is because we do now have a management plan in place for the aquatic reserve. Uh, Lands Commissioner Goldmark put out a draft plan in May. It was out for public comment, for industry comment, everybody commented on it, they came back, they developed it and put it out in November. As soon as that was put in place is when we really were able to go hard and start marketing this facility because now all the, all the information and all the programs that we have to follow, it's a very high bar and we're happy with that, that's fine. It's a very high environmental bar, but now we get we know what the rules of the game are and we can employ it. And now we're going to start doing We're working with the folks for Ecology and WDFW and the other folks on the settlement agreement. And now we're getting ready to do those studies, which are benchmarks that you have to do a couple of years before construction so you can do your adaptive management programs. That's what we did. Thank you for asking that question. Bob, let me, just, let me just add, that's an enforceable agreement and uh, with, with an arbitration provision. So if, if any of the parties to that agreement do not feel that the agreement is being upheld they have they have an ability to enforce okay it. next question so there's been an assertion that a multi-commodity facility at cherry point has long been in the whatcom county plan well what about things like the natural heritage task force which identify precious places will this be able to be included in the eis i chaired the natural heritage task force i actually wrote the report and um, the Task Force report um, has always sought to harmonize uh, industry and business and the environment, but targeted special places where we had uh, a greater opportunity to advance our our uh, uh, our enjoy enjoyment of nature. And some of those things are shoreline access issues. For example, there's at Cherry Point, there's a great deal of shoreline that is kind of <laughs> informally and poorly used. <laughs> that uh, really would be uh, a tremendous addition to the shoreline access for our community. My hunch is some of those issues are going to be discussed during this process. The SSA folks are getting most of the traffic here. I'm going to ask if anybody has a question for Bob Over Ferris here. or Matt Crow. Over here. Yes, right here. No? Oh, folks for SSA. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. Hi, we're next. Uh, Dean Baring and a question for SSA. From what I've gathered from the presentation today, and I appreciate everyone coming and informing, um, it sounds like there's going to be a, a cost to the community of Bellingham for us folks that live here. And I'm wondering what economic benefit is that SSA is going to see from having this terminal built out at Cherry Point. <laughs> First of all, I don't know that there is an economic cost to what. I'm talking about the, our health issues. I don't live, with, I live very close to the, to the train tracks, but you know, I've already seen the impact. Um, I, I have children, I, I know that it's gonna impact my family's life. Okay. I, uh, that's the cost I'm talking about that the community has to bear. Okay. I but know there's gonna be you've a- You've asked the question, let's move on. A, a quick answer from each side, if you could, please. All right, so, so the question was, how will that say I can have benefit? Sure. Um, hopefully, we, you know, can pay our debt service and make some money. I mean, we're uh, we're not a philanthropist. I, I attest to that. Uh, we are a group of, uh, of businessmen that want to uh, make our investments and, and and make this project work. But you also have to understand that this is infrastructure projects are a slow developing project and a slow pay. If you look at what the public does on their infrastructure projects and you look at what we do. I mean, the build and, and the, the timeline for economic return on infrastructure projects is, is pretty slow. I mean, this is a $600 million project, and it takes a long time to pay that off. Yeah, we've penciled out the numbers of what you Okay, uh, would, would Matt or Bob like to respond? I don't like to cut you off, but there are a lot of other folks here. I can ask questions. Okay, another question here. Oh, over here. All right, skip. Hi, I'm Steve. Um, this is for uh, Mr. Ferris. When I go down to Boulevard Park and ride my bicycle through there, I see coal trains pass through there on a fairly regular basis. Washington from up and rent zones above the boulevard. Can you tell me where I would find the deleterious impact that they're, that they're creating now? Where is the damage from the current coal plant? The old adage about um, what you can't see is going to hurt you. I would say um, when you look at things like diesel particulates and that, those are long-term accumulative sorts of impacts. Um, though they're 
you know, you can't see them, they are very real and they are very measurable. Uh, and in all instances, when, when people look at um, those sorts of things, um, you know, eventually it's going to happen. Um, the, the dust, um, at this point, we don't know what's going to happen with the dust, but I suspect that, um, there are places out there where dust is coming off the, off the trains, uh, and it's probably dust that's smaller than what folks can see, but in some instances it is stuff that people can see. We have people call us and talk about um, dust on their balconies, and, um, and at this point, that's a little hard to track down, but um, you know, Matt had somebody call the other day who's talking about um, their business uh, is booming at this point uh, because they're a window washer um, washing windows near Roberts Point um, because the diesel particulates bond with the, the coal dust and it, it's pretty hard to get off windows and, and uh, uh, they were pretty grateful. We're, we're, we're getting close to closing time. We'd like to have one more. One, one more question. Right over there. Bob, is over here. Bob, over here. Okay. Yes, good afternoon. Tom Anderson. We've been talking a lot about one side of the transportation question, which is the trains. What about the ships? How many ships are involved, and what's being done to mitigate the potential for shipwrecks? Because in my lifetime, we've been very lucky. We haven't had a tanker spill in Washington County, and it seems to me that you're interacting with two oil refinery port piers. There's a lot of greater potential. Okay. Uh, who wants to take that on first? Sure, sure. I'll take it. Um, you know, part, part of the whole EIS process is that we have to do a vessel, analysis, vessel traffic analysis study, which is, is talks about how many vessels there would be coming in and out of the terminal and how often they come in and what the approaches would be and how it would work through the channels with the uh, Washington State's Pilot Association. There's a very um, definitive program that's in place with the Washington State Pilots and with the Coast Guard, and they regulate all that very well. I mean, they've done that. I mean, it's not just ships that you see coming into Cherry Point. We have ships, uh, we have numbers and numbers of ships coming into Seattle and to Tacoma and to Olympia. And these guys do an excellent job of regulating that and controlling that traffic. Um, and I've been, I've been with the company for 20 years, and I don't, I've never heard of any incident with the pilots have had in any of these areas. Okay, uh, do you guys want to take yes. I mean, the only thing here is that we do the math on these sorts of things, and operating at full capacity, you're probably, if you're using the largest ships, you're talking about maybe 200 ships a year, right? Some, some of, of Cape size ships. I mean, that's, I think, a fairly easy calculation to make. Um, that's a lot of ships, a lot of very big ships. We've got time for one more question. We have one more, and then we have some introductions to make, and then we have gifts to give. <laughs> We've talked uh, so far, this is a question to SSA, about the enormous possible detrimental effects for your plans to go through for the environment. My question is economic effects. Uh, what plans are there for compensation for individual property owners uh, owning property very close to the rail, as well as small businesses? I've heard nothing about this. Well, I first of all, I disagree with the uh, assumption. And uh, I live very close to the railroad, too. I probably live as close, almost as close to anybody here. I hear those trains. I, I know what traffic's like. We've had higher levels of train traffic in the past uh, than we do now. And the railroad has uh, uh, indicated that this project is likely to bring traffic up to levels that are within historical norms. I also want to mention one thing about coal dust. I actually flew back to Wyoming to talk to the railroad and mines and to see what they are doing. <laughs> there will be, they're looking at three methods of uh, containment. And this is a near mine issue. This is not a long tracks issue all the way up here. They are looking at three protocols to see which is most cost effective. Shaping, compaction, and what they call the hairspray method. And all of them said there will be new protocols in place long before this project is ever built. Okay. Uh, we need to wrap it up. Do you guys have a closing word? Yeah, I mean, the only response I've got to that is that Lambert's Point in Virginia, which uses all those control mechanisms, it doesn't have an open air um, facility there. The, the um, uh, soil within a half kilometer of the plant is 20% cold. Um, so that has to be coming from somewhere. Um, you know, it may be magic dust, but it's, it's, it's there. They measured it. Um, it is an issue with every
I'd like to thank these gentlemen and all of you and turn it. Some quick business things. SSA Marine has some information in the back uh, of the table. As you ask that you want to do that. Also, members, please turn your badges in. Also, we have some journalists in the room <coughs> who have come from as far away as Seattle. We have a gentleman from Lock and Watch over here whose name escapes me. We have Joel Connolly from the Seattle PI Online who's just sitting down now. And we have seven students from the uh, Advanced journalism class from Western Washington University. There may be others. I want to thank them for coming. Thank you.